wanted to say something about the cup length uh, numerical quantity you can assign to a graph, finite simple graph. Uh, it's a cohomological notion and algebraic notion and uh, it is a lower bound for the category of a graph. The category of a graph is just the minimal number of contractible graphs which cover the whole uh, graph and this is then this is a topological notion obviously and then we have a, the number of critical points which is a analytic notion the minimal number of critical points which you can have on a on a graph and this is all graph theoretical and uh, this inequality holds for every finite simple graph this is work which i have begun 10 years ago with frank Joselis, who passed it away last year and i I thought it would be actually nice to rewrite, relook at that and also simplify some of the things. For example, the notion of the cup product needs the notion of exterior product, exterior algebra, and how do you do that on a graph or on a network, on a simplicity complex. This is a, a, you can do that in many different ways, but what is the fastest way to get this cup length computed? on a computer and you enter a graph, you get a number telling what the cup length is. And this is not that difficult because what we can do is we can just look at the cohomology class. This is the kernel. This is a kernel of a concrete matrix, n times n matrix, if there are n complete subgraphs. This, this is a, a vector space. This uh, kernel is a vector space, which has a basis and then we can compute with this basis, we can compute this product and see how many products maximally have a given non-zero entry. This is a very beautiful theorem of Lustig and Schneerman, and uh, so there are just cases where it is sharp. I mean, if the graph is contractible, like a complete graph that's contractible, then uh, there is no uh, cohomology except the zero cohomology and the cup length is uh, equal to zero and uh, so the category is one because the whole graph covers the whole graph and the number of critical points is one it's just a minimum if you take a function on the vertices the minimum is a critical point it's a critical point because the unit sphere is empty the unit sphere is empty it's not contractible and so it's a critical point so this is all very intuitive in the case of the sphere it's also sharp in the case of a sphere you have a, a two uh, contractible graphs can cover the whole graph and also the couplings there is just there is you know it's simply connected there is only one uh, cohomology class which is a volume form but uh, the volume so that the couplings is uh, yeah the couplings is equal to one because we have just this volume form and then we have uh, uh, here also sharp two categories two the number of critical points of course is also two you can have a function which has a maximum and a minimum and no other critical point so that characterizes also spheres and then the third example which is also sharp is the case of a, a donut where you have now the possibility to take a one form like that and a one form like that and uh, take the exterior power and what you get is the volume form so the uh, in general, we have d. We have a d-dimensional torus. You have cup length is equal to uh, d, and so also this inequality is sharp in this case. So it's not always sharp. For example, for the for the uh, Klein bottle, cup, cup length is equal to one. Then the category is equal to three, and uh, so it's not a sphere, but it's kind of just again the next bigger one and the number of critical points is also three. You can build a function with just three uh, critical points. And it's important these critical points are not necessarily critical points of a Morse function. There's another parallel theory which deals with Morse functions and then you have a, also an inequality which says the, Betty, the kth Betty number is smaller and num smaller equal than the number of critical points with index k. So that's another, that's the weak Morse inequality. And uh, so this is a, a, a parallel uh, theory. And, but here, these are general critical points. It doesn't have to be general functions. They don't have to be Morse functions. Morse functions are functions where the unit spheres at critical points are spheres. 
the stable spheres are spheres. So that's uh, uh, another motivation for this kind of uh, uh, little presentation is to actually have a workable nice definition of uh, Clifford algebra or special case if the uh, quadratic form is zero to have the exterior algebra or the Grassmann algebra something which Grassmann did big opus he wrote uh, nobody read it and uh, but uh, he was you know, so abandoning the whole uh, mathematics later but a very kind of natural notion it's a extension of a, you have a vector space and you get it from the vector space and like if functorially you get this uh, exterior algebra it's like you get from a graph it's actually very very similar from a graph you get automatically this uh, uh, simplicial complex so this is only involving vertices and edges kind of just the vector space notion this involves all differential forms which you can have a very very natural thing how do you do that and when I worked with Frank on that, we did it in a more complicated way. I mean, obviously you have to build some, some kind of tensor product and then you have to shuffle things around such that it satisfies the supercommutative property. It turns out that for this purpose of computing the cup product, we don't really have to do all this shuffling. I mean, all this shuffling needs time. This makes a big difference, especially if you have to wait an hour or, or 720 hours. So it's really kind of not a trivial thing to get the computation, make the computation as simple as possible. And uh, what, I, what, I, what I decided to do is actually define the, the tensor product with respect to a base point. So what you do, and you have that automatically in every simplex if you have an order on the vertices. And so you always select out one vertex. And if you do that, so that's kind of the zero thing, then uh, the, num the vector space which you have of the one form, so the vectors form just, uh, so in this case, a three-dimensional space. So the first coordinate, second coordinate, and third coordinate. And then you have, a, if you build the, uh, power, so if you build, uh, you take the uh, tensor product of this with this, you get a function on the triangles. So there are also three triangles here. If you take three vectors and you take the exterior product of three vectors, you get the volume form. So this is really what happens, and this is kind of the key. I put it here in a very small box, but that's the kind of key observation is that if you make this construction with a complete graph with m plus one vertices, what you get is this exterior algebra is, uh, first of all, a vector space, which has two to the m dimensions. In this case, it would be uh, two to the three, it would be eight dimensional. So there's already an eight dimensional space here hidden. And uh, then you have also the multiplication. And this multiplication is the same multiplication you have in the classical case. If you would work with a three dimensional space, build the uh, exterior algebra, you get an eight-dimensional space, which is exactly the same space. <coughs> Luster Nick-Schneerman's story, it's a very beautiful story, and I'm wrapping up with some, some kind of review honoring uh, Frank, just uh, to have that uh, smooth out things a little bit. And uh, so the first kind of case which is interesting is the case of K2. So this is a very, very simple graph, right? It has only two vertices and one edge. And so the vector space, which this represents, is the one-dimensional vector space, because the one forms, the one vectors, right? the, that's what you have, is the p forms are actually also called, the p vectors are just as one uh, number which you can assign to that. And now, very important, I'm working always with uh, co-cycles. I'm working with differential forms, which are co-cycles, where the exterior derivative is zero. And that actually makes the things work because what now you have, if you have the value here at that point, that's the zero dimensional part, and we have to do the value here, which is the one dimensional part. This gives you R2. By the co cycle condition, this value has to be the same than this. So you really are, you know, from the dimension point of view, in the right setup. And uh, so that's here. This is already interesting, right? Because this, is, this is already gives you a two dimensional space. And then there is this natural deformation you can do from exterior algebra to a Clifford algebra if you have a quadratic form. Uh, it's very important in physics and another motivation to look at that. If you take the quadratic form, a special quadratic form, you want that i times i is minus one, not zero, but minus one, then you get the complex numbers. 
So this is already, if you can build here, the complex numbers. So the Clifford algebra of that uh, with that special uh, quadratic form gives you the co complex numbers. Already interesting. And now the next interesting thing is uh, uh, the K3. So in this case, what is the vector space it represents? Because the one forms, the one vectors are, there are just two, which really relevant by the cosine condition, the third value is determined. So you need only the values here, then values here, or and then the values on the triangle. So what is the dimension? One, two, three, four. Dimension of the Clifford algebra or the exterior algebra, Grassmann algebra, is four dimensions here. So this is four dimensions. All this is a four dimensional space of course cycles. They are first of all the scalars, so this is a function here. By the co cycle condition, this determines also the values here. Then we have the one forms, this is here and here. By the co cycle condition, this is determined. And then we have the two form, which is also called a pseudo. The two form is also called a pseudo, a pseudo scalar. So it's something which uh, puzzles students often, especially in physics, there's kind of they, they transform in a different way. So when you take one vector, so that's, these are the values here, A and B are values here, or C and D are the values here and here, and you produce the, uh, this exterior product, you get, the, you get a function on the triangles. But this now determines, is determined on, on, on parity, if you're changing the coordinates in a way so that you flip things, this changes the sign. This is why it's called a, a pseudoscalar. So this is already interesting. And again, if you make the deformation, you build a Clifford structure, a Clifford algebra of like, there are two kind of three different cases. Either you get the uh, algebra of two times two matrices, four dimensional, right? There are real numbers here, A, B, C, D. This algebra, as you can multiply, that's a kind of the Clifford algebra here. Or then this is even more interesting, the one, one Clifford algebra, which are the, high, which are the, the quaternions one of the division algebras. So you get already kind of all the associative division algebras here. Very nice. Associative tensor product, so this produces an associative exterior product, and so you have an associative algebra also in the Clifford case, and then you get the quaternions. So on this, if you think about the triangle, that already defines you the quaternions. So this is the scalars, this is i, j, and the k is a uh, on the on the triangle and then the next thing is the k4 so if you take k4 that's and also interesting from the calculus point of view because now there are three this, is, this is represents the r3 the three-dimensional space of one forms right there are three one forms which kind of are important all the others you can compute by the co-cycle condition right by the co-cycle condition this and this and this are determined and then uh, what you have is also when you take now the power so you get this triangle this triangle this triangle this triangle value is determined also by the co-cycle condition and then you have also a volume form which is a pseudo scalar again so totally we have eight so one three three one so we have one dimension and the three dimension and three dimensions and one dimension again. So in total we have an eight dimensional space and maybe the interesting thing from the point of view of physics is uh, in the Clifford case is direct sum of the quaternions, quaternions and or the complex numbers, the algebra of two times two complex matrices. So it's already kind of very simplest, one of the simplest, the simplest cases are already interesting mathematically. And uh, for a general graph, we can just implement that. For a general graph, we have the kernel. We actually can can kind of you now restrict that to the to the kernel of L. And if you apply the L to that, because this is in the kernel, and this is in the kernel, so also the product is in the kernel. It's a genius of that of that definition. And then you have uh, also you are in the kernel. So this multiplication preserves the kernel of L, and so it's an algebra on uh, L. And then we can look how many can we multiply to get something uh, non-zero. Non and so we can compute this cup product for a general graph. Kind of useful, nice, because once you have the cup product, you have also a bound for the minimal number of critical points and that can be useful in physics. Critical points are very important in physics. So these are variational problems, for example, 
yeah, solutions are critical points. So you want to know how many solutions do you have? And Luce and Schneiderman uh, have actually used that in the, in, the, in the context of calculus of variations. You want to know how many geodesics there are on a, on a sphere, for example. So I think that's, that's it for today. Wrap it up.